it's a privilege to be here addressing all of you with this uh, very special topic, elephant in the room. I'm usually asked to speak about different things. Often there are situations where I would have uh, written a piece that I think is interesting for an op-ed piece, and then the editor calls me and says, oh, this is a bit serious, you know? Can you tone it down a bit? That's what we like from you, the lighter feel-good elements. So yes, uh, guilty as charged. I'm a maker of films, and often they tend to be feel-good, and I have my reasons for that. But here, what am I here to talk about? Something that most people don't talk about. Let's look at where I am right now. I'm a filmmaker working in the film industry in our country at a time when the film industry happens to be a hot topic. So far, most interviews, I would always be asked this question. What does it feel like to be a woman director? Trust me, I hate that question. There is so much else that I would love to share with the audiences. But why that one question? But since last year, things have changed. The questions have changed, and hopefully the answers will keep coming. In last year's happenings, one of the major things was the emergence of two words in our lexicon, which have, for some people, become very empowering. For others, they have struck terror. And these two words are me too. Two simple words we use every day. But these words have been used by individuals who have kept quiet for the longest time. People who have had to face, have to face things that are undiscussable, things which they find so difficult to put behind them, things on top of which they have built their, you know, past, their present, and possibly their futures. And by speaking about these things, they have actually unsettled all of that. But why do they then do that? Because the bitterness of what has happened has remained with them. That bitterness has remained with them to the extent that it colors every single other experience that comes after that, which is why these courageous people have spoken up. And now that that has happened, we've come to a slightly different space. So was that the big elephant in the room? I'm afraid not. Right now, I find it very difficult to uh, you know, go through every day without having conversations about Me Too and about the film industry. People I know or don't know will you know, reach out anywhere, be it in a lift, be it in a room, anywhere, and insist on having conversations about this. And suddenly I'm surprised to see how aware everybody is, how educated everyone seems to be about the happenings in the film industry how they seem to know about all the harassment and all the problems and everything that they didn't know about so far. How is that? Suddenly everyone knows everything. And the assumption is these are problems which are limited to the film industry or the media industry. They seem to think that these problems do not exist beyond that. They seem to think that these are limited to a limited circle of people. And what gives anyone that impression? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the elephant in the room. The fact that these problems exist everywhere, and yet people would prefer to think that, oh no, I'm not part of that problem, I'm not part of that solution, I'm not part of anything that's messy. How is that when we face this kind of bias everywhere, Right from when a child is born, the experiences that you go through, the experiences that life takes you through, be it in a public place, in a private space, in your very home, in your most personal relationships, how is it that you can ignore the bias? Now, bias is an interesting word. It's a four-letter word, which people tend to speak of much more in activist circles than anywhere else. But beyond the activists, is no one experiencing this bias? How is it that biases are allowed to exist? When you and I say we are part of society, aren't we part of that bias? When 
we have such huge biases existing and we are not doing anything about it? Aren't we playing a role in perpetuating that bias? It's important for us to think about this because there comes a time when any bias reaches a point that some things happen where they just slap you hard in the face and make you look at them. When we had the incident of Nirbhaya, I do not want to repeat again and again and again because we have all heard it, we have all felt it. What happened in 2012 in New Delhi rocked the conscience of the nation. Why was it? Why did that happen? Why did so many individuals identify with the trauma that that girl went through that day? Why was that? Isn't it because all of us know violation firsthand at some level or the other? Isn't it because we know what that feels like? We have seen things happen. Maybe not to that degree, but violations are not just what happened on that bus that night. Violations are the kind of speech one has to hear when one walks down the road. Violations are what happens on one's Facebook when you put up a status that might be controversial only to hear vicious comments under that. Violations are what you have to face every time your gender is brought up in a professional circumstance. All these are violations. And when we speak about bias, there are many different kinds of bias. We are aware of racial bias, we are aware of regional bias, of language bias, but the bias that affects 50% of the population, how is it that we allow that to continue? We are in a century where we have actually outlived some of these biases. And if not now, when are things going to change? When we speak about apartheid, there was a whole movement to put that behind us. We are in a place where even now, we are still battling areas with relation to caste, with relation to religion, all of that. But when it comes to something as basic as a gender bias, why is it that we are not doing enough? If you take the population of our country, we're going by the tricker. If you take half of that population, and you take 1% of that half of that population, do we have empowered women to even that extent in this country? We don't. And when we speak of empowerment, what are we speaking of? We're speaking about basic right to security, to opportunity, to space. Space for one's own body, space for one's own mind. These are not luxuries. These are the basics of what our constitution guarantees us. And why is there a second class treatment for anyone? We are all equal citizens in this country then why does this have to be seen as something that will not be discussed? When we have a problem, why not face it? When there is this kind of a situation in one industry, why don't we see the symptoms of that which are all around us? When we think of how there is a certain growth of a movement, I'd like to share how a certain story can be born. Imagine, in a long, long ago kind of scenario, once upon a time, somewhere in a far away land, there was born a thought about this size. This thought grew into something that started moving among people. It became popular. The thought became practice. The practice again moved further around people and became a belief system. Children who were born were fed with the same practice and the same belief system. They digested it and they grew up with it. As they grew, the thought grew into practice, belief system, and eventually, across generations, it became culture. What is culture? Culture is a set of practiced values. Any value that we practice every day becomes culture. Recently, I picked up a habit that when I drink a glass of water, if there's any water left in the glass, I would just pour it into my plants. My son, before I knew it, I found him doing the same thing. And then it was my husband. And then guests who visited our home started doing the same thing. Now they tell me they do the same thing in their house. It's as simple as that. 
it's a certain kind of culture if many more people adopt it. What do you call cultural practices that we have for a long time? They are called tradition. We carry forth traditions very often blindly, very often with so much love and care. But along with the love and care, we really need to look into them, to study them, to understand them, to explore them, to understand their relevance and what context they were born. We need to understand what their relevance is today. And then we need to evaluate why and how we should take these traditions ahead. That evaluation should be part of our daily process. Because these traditions, gentlemen and ladies, affect our daily life. The arc that I told you about a thought becoming practice and a belief system, and then culture, and then becoming a tradition, is also applicable to the positive and the negative. Now, what is a negative tradition? A negative tradition, I think, is one which is baseless, which does not actually have a proper reason to exist. It probably started as a functional arrangement, but eventually acquired power equations and then results in oppression of a certain section. Now that is definitely negative. So we need to evaluate these things. Bias very often comes to us in the garb of culture and tradition. We need to recognize that and then we need to address it in today's context. That will make us understand where we are. So in this whole thing, what is the role we play? You and I, we are part of generations. But today in India, I believe, half of our population is in its 20s or below. How many of you here are in your 20s? Okay, I'm very happy to see. Just like our country, you have a very young demographic here and that means you can be the agents for change. Because more than ever, we have never had such a young population. And if this young population takes upon itself that they will be agents of change and leave out the things that we don't want to carry ahead, then that is the time that will indicate how things can be better. I would urge each one of us to introspect and understand how we play a role in each of this. When every single action we do, every single action we condone, every single action we ignore, all of it is our collective responsibility. The other day I went to watch a movie and there are these lovely ads that are being made by some companies now which speak about empowering the woman or speak about the men sharing the load, all of that. And there was a little boy sitting in front of me and the ad plays and suddenly he turns to his mom and says, Mom, this is what you always say. And the mom nods and looks at the dad and the dad doesn't look anywhere, just looks at the screen. End of story. E for end of story, E for elephant. That little boy gives me hope. That little boy tells me that yes, there's reason to expect a better future. So that, with that, I will conclude my words. Thank you very much. I hope and I really look forward to a better one ahead. Thank you.